Hello there, Story Chasers. This is Amber, and I have an amazing special guest here today. This is Courtney Armstrong from The Flipping Nomad. And today we're going to do an interview with her. She has this amazing, I call it rags to riches story. I met Courtney through the Escapers group. My channel is all about empowering people, inspiring and motivating. And I think you're going to really love her story and feel very inspired by her rags to riches and also the entrepreneurial side that has come of her being a nomad. So let's just get into it. How are you doing? First of all, you doing all right? Oh, you know, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, you know, like you touched on kind of the entrepreneurial side of what I have going on here, you know, we've got a lot of irons in the fire and so we've got a lot of big, uh, things moving. And so it feels like a lot to juggle and sometimes I get overwhelmed, but, uh, you know, taking a step back and, you know, like you mentioned my rags to riches story, like, remembering how it all started. And I'm so grateful for having all of these irons in the fire. It's a blessing for sure. And it wasn't that long ago that you really went into this lifestyle. Um, it was seven years ago. And by the way, just so everybody knows, your backdrop there is where? Uh, this is my RV, actually. This is not a green screen. Uh, this is live and in the flesh. Um, this is my, um, I guess you'd call it my personal RV, but there's a humongous story behind it, too, that we'll get into a little bit more later, I'm sure. Absolutely. I wanted you guys all to know that I've seen this RV before. It's absolutely amazing. And uh, it's not an actual sticks and bricks house that sh that's in the backdrop there. By the way, I am in a sticks and bricks house right now. I'm visiting a friend and I really need a great internet. So I'm not in the van, but um, we're going to get into Courtney's story here a little bit on how she got started. So let's just start there. How did you get started with being a nomad? And then we'll talk a little bit more about how this actually went into this entrepreneurial side of the business. I have a very different story than most people. You know, most people's stories of how they got into RVing was, um, you know, almost something out of a movie where, you know, they got fed up with life and they sold everything and they bought the RV and they hit the road. And it's, you know, just like this magical fairy tale story. Um, and my story is very opposite of that. Um, like I mentioned, it was seven years ago. And um, at that time, my dad had had a stroke and he had two businesses, um, but neither business was doing very well. And so I basically had to drop everything to take over the business. Um, but because the businesses weren't doing very well, there was hardly any money left over to pay me a salary. So I was living basically in the only housing situation that I could afford, which was, um, in a four bedroom house with three friends and, um, our lease was coming up for renewal. So we all sat down to talk about what we were going to do. And I found out that they had all made other housing plans that didn't involve me. So one went off and got a one bedroom apartment and the other two went off and got a three bedroom house with somebody else. And so I was basically left hanging, you know, here I am in the fight of my life. Like my dad is sick. I'm trying to save his businesses. You know, my parents, marriage was already dissolving prior to this stress and the stress was not helping. I don't have a, a, any kind of a sizable salary to back me up. And now here I have two weeks to scramble to find somewhere to live. And it was pretty a pretty gut wrenching, you know, because it's it's just like everything was culminating and like falling on my shoulders. And then now here, I don't have somewhere to live, you know? And so that really kind of takes whatever little amount of security that I had to hold on to now that's gone too. And so I threw myself a pity party for a couple of days and, um, thought about living in my car. Um, but then I was like, well, you know, maybe I could live in, in the office and at least there's running water there, you know, but then I said, well, let's at least try for something. Let's, you know, see if there's any, you know, like Craigslist ads for roommates wanted or something like that. And so, um, I reached out to a family friend, 
Um, his name's Ron and he, uh, managed the KOA campground back in my hometown. And, but he's just kind of one of these guys that just knows everybody in town. So I thought maybe he would know of a mother-in-law suite that was vacant or someone that needed a roommate or something and told him what was going on. And I said, do you know of anything? And at the time of talking to him, I didn't know people lived in our like I didn't know that was a thing. So then he says, um, well, actually there's a fifth wheel in the KOA that he managed and it's for sale and the owner will finance it for you if you want. And then there's a work camper position at the front desk. So that's basically where you work and, you know, take reservations in exchange for everything. So he said, that'll cover your site rent, all of your electricity, your propane, um, you know, internet quarters to use laundry, the whole nine yards. So he says, your only housing expense will be the payment on the fifth wheel. And he said, are you interested? And I was like, no, but like, it's a roof <laughs> and it's a furnace and it's some hot water. And like, it's better than living in the office. And so I was like, I'll take it. That moment of like buying that RV and moving in. I mean, it was my rock bottom, you know, and I tried to put on a really brave face and, you know, try to kind of spin it in my own head. Like, oh, you know, this could be like the tiny house thing and maybe the RV park neighbors are nice and, you know, this, let's try to make the best of it. But it was, you know, at my core, I was, I was embarrassed about it. I hated it. I felt borderline homeless. The only thing that I knew about RVs was the, the lesson that I got when I moved in, the guy says, um, leave your gray tank open, leave your black tank closed, have fun. And I was like, oh, wow. What's a black tank? And <laughs> oh, so yeah, I went from like a having- foreign concept for you. Yeah, oh yeah. Funny story is I thought the oven in that first RV was broken. It just turns out I didn't know how to light it because I didn't know anything about RVs, right? And so mm-hmm. so that's basically the very long-winded way of saying I went from, you know, having never looked at an RV before to buying that one and moving in 3 days later and totally embarrassed about it. Like it was just I was so desperate for housing that I moved into that RV. But that planted the seed to like the most gorgeous story that has come out of it. And I'm so excited. I really want to dive into the story, but I want to stay with this one for just a second. So you've said several times that you were embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? I think because I had that stigma of like, you know, band down by the river, you know, like this is what homeless people do, you know, and I was a recent college grad and I was like, this is not how my life plan was going. Like I had never looked at being a minimalist or living tiny or anything. And so I had that stigma that I think the rest of the world kind of has now it is changing, you know, with like more and more people now, seven years later being digital nomads. And they're kind of being this new movement of minimalism even as well. Um, but that was just getting started back then. And so I jumped to conclusions basically. And I, I made a snap decision about what the lifestyle was like. And what do you think actually made that change for you where you weren't embarrassed by it anymore? So that's kind of um, a funny story too. So I have a a little dog. Um, She's a cute little scruffy thing. Um, She's a rescue. And so we're kind of like a who rescued who story because I got her four months before that fateful decision by my roommates. Um, And I got her just to kind of help me through what I was going through with my dad. And then she really became my crutch when I moved into the RV. And so Um, she's actually part of the story of how my mindset shifted because like literally the only entertainment I could afford was taking her on a walk in the evenings. Mm -hmm. And so we would walk the RV park and walk and walk and walk the RV park, you know, to surround all of the little sites and stuff. And, um, I got to looking at the people that were there on the nightly basis, um, because they were all there on vacation and they were all having fun and, you know, like they're barbecuing and playing music and, and, um, you know, playing cornhole and drinking beer. And, you know, uh, people would offer me, you know, cheeseburgers or whatever, as I'm, as I'm walking by or, or wave or whatever. And so their mindset and their attitude towards our being started rubbing off on me. Um, and I was like, okay, but then I would tell myself, well, you know, they're, they're on vacation. This isn't their, their lifestyle. But then as I was living in the RV park and then especially working at the front office too, I got to know the neighbors that were there on a stationary basis, much like myself, they weren't traveling, you know, they were, that's where they lived. You know, that was their, 
their permanent home. And uh, they were all like their own kind of quirky. Like, you know, some of them had sold their house and they just didn't care anymore. Other ones were just, you know, like personality plus. And, you know, I swear you could make a movie out of that place because there were there were so many characters and they all really kind of embraced me. Most of them were of more like retired age and couples yeah. and uh, I was definitely the youngest, you know, I was 25 at the time. I remember this one time I lost water pressure and I mentioned that to one of the maintenance guys. And next thing I know, there's six guys at my RV tearing it apart, trying to find where the block, the block was. And I was like, wow, you know, these people are really good hearted, really nice. It took me a little bit longer to warm up to the mindset of the full timers, but that's really where the shift came was just being so immersed in that. RV park and, and watching how other people embrace the lifestyle too. And, and that helped me break down my initial mental barrier. You purchased the RV or the trailer. Mm-hmm. What kind of trailer was it? Uh, it was okay. a fifth wheel and it was a keystone, which that will come into play later. The name of your company is the flipping nomad. So mm-hmm. Clearly, at some point, you recognize that there was an opportunity here. How did that start? There's a couple key points that happened um, to get to, you know, current day Flipping Nomad. And that very first RV that I bought that the family friend helped me buy, uh, it was a 2006 Keystone Outback Sydney edition, and it had white cabinets from the factory. That's quite unusual, isn't it? The white very- very unusual and especially a 2006, you know, current day now being 2021. Yeah. There's a lot of white cabinets coming out of the, you know, the factory, but back then, no, Keystone was very ahead of their time on that. And so they had only built that one brand with white cabinets for three years. And that was it uh, because, you know, the buying population hadn't caught up to that yet. That was what I thought RVs were like was, you know, like it had white cabinets and brown leather furniture and tan carpet. And it, Kind of looked like a cute little house on the inside. I didn't get to shop for that first one. So I didn't know what normal RVs looked like. Um, A year went by and I was like, you know what? I really do kind of like this lifestyle. Like it's affordable. I enjoy living on my own. Like the RV park neighbors are quirky and fun. And, you know, this could be a really good way to, for me to kind of get my feet back under me, you know, now that I've kind of got things settled with my dad's business and got family taken care of. And, you know, now it's time to focus on, on me and getting my feet back under me and maybe continuing to live in the RV park is not necessarily a bad thing. And so I said, I'd like to keep living this way. I like being a a minimalist, but I want an RV that's laid out different. So I said, I'll just go get another RV that has the white cabinets. That's, you know, cute on the inside and you're smiling because you know, (laughs) I said, I'll just go get one that has white cabinets that has a floor plan that I want. Well, I obsessively searched, like I searched and I searched and I searched and there was not a website out there that I was not on. (laughs) And then as I was like figuring out that they were so brown, I was like, no, there's gotta be, I'm missing something. Like there's gotta be white out there. And like, I finally like admitted defeat that I want does not exist. What I wanted wasn't extreme. I wanted a rear kitchen with white cabinets that had two slides. Finally found one that had the floor plan that I wanted. It was a rear kitchen with two slides, but it was just the classic brown, horrible floral prints. And so I said, okay, this is, this is the floor plan that I want. It's just not the colors that I want. So I said, well, I could paint, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't know. Can you paint an RV? And so I did a quick Google search, nothing came up, but that's because now I realized that nobody was doing it at that time. It's a different story now. So I bought that RV, brought it home and decided that I wanted to renovate it, but I didn't know how. I didn't have any construction experience and I didn't have anybody to help me either. I literally took a cabinet door down. I took it into Home Depot and I set it on the paint counter and I said, how do I paint this? And the guy at the paint counter like walked me through it. And so I bought my supplies and I went home and I started doing it and uh, renovated that first one. I was really proud of it, but like now looking back at the pictures, it's like, (laughs) <laughs> like average, like, you know, kind of, <laughs> so, so, so. I was proud of that little home. A couple more years went by and I was continuing to live in that fifth wheel, the one that I had renovated at the same RV park, I had a lot more brain power freed up. I got my parents taken care of, like I was in a job and, but I wasn't happy in the job. And so I was like, 
I kept coming back to my buying experience of like obsessively searching for white cabinets and they're not being any. So I was like, well, maybe like, maybe there's a business here. Like maybe other people want something custom and unique too. But then I was talking to myself in circles because then I was like, well, Courtney, there's a reason nobody else is doing it. Like you're the only weirdo that wants something custom and white. And I was like, no, like there's like millions of RVs out there, right? Like there's gotta be a small handful of people who want something unique too. And so I would like talk to myself in circles. And finally, you know what? Worst case scenario, I'll just lose some time. Like, I don't think I'll lose any money. I'll just lose some time. And when I finally figured that out and I was like, okay, I'm okay with that. Then that's kind of the kickoff of the flipping nomad. So as I was like obsessively searching for the second one, which was the first one that I had renovated, I got really clued into values and what rigs were worth. Cause I'm not kidding you. I had looked at thousands of them, like trying to find what I wanted. So there were a few in there that I had bought and just cleaned and then sold, um, because I knew like people were moving and desperate to get rid of them or they had really terrible ads, just like real estate, your money's made at the buy. And so that was the same with RV. There was one of them, probably my favorite was I bought it for 5,500 and I knew that it was super far below book value. The guy had a sudden change of plans and was moving to California and needed the rig gone like immediately. So I bought it for 5,500, brought it home, vacuumed it. That was it. Sold it for 11. Whoa. That's a huge difference. Yeah. I knew that that 55 was an incredible price because of all of the obsessive searching that I had done trying to find my second RV. Like I said, tried the business and, uh, business has taken off. (laughs) So what's transpired? Because I kind of know the end story, but we want everybody else. Yeah, to feel- there's a lot that has transpired. I so how had- did you get from flipping a $5,500 trailer to selling it for 11000 monster to this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. There's, the story oh, takes a lot of twists and turns. I show people, by the way, all your pictures. I'll go to Instagram. I'm like, look at this. And they're like, that's the house. I'm like, nope, it's an RV. (laughs) It's an RV. RV. So as I was renovating the interior, that one RV, it was a Denali. I was building it with the intentions of selling it. I also had my personal Instagram account. The name on the Instagram account was the Flipping Nomad, just because I thought it was funny. Like, and it was just my personal account. You know, like I was also posting class. Instagram things of my dog and sunsets and food and, you know, like typical personal Instagram stuff. But my account was public as I was just posting things, you know, for like my old college friends to see what I was doing with this RV. Other people who I didn't know personally started following me on Instagram. And there was one point where I was like, this is weird. Like, I don't know these people personally, like they're following me. They're talking to me. Like they're asking me questions about this RV. So I was talking to a friend about it and I was like, I think I'm going to make my account private because this is freaking me out. Um, and he was like, no, he was like, Courtney, he's like, you've got something here. He's like, you need to lean into this and embrace this. And right, let, what kind of questions were they asking you? What are you using for that backsplash? Or, you know, how did you paint? Or what are you using for paint? Or, you know, just like really simple, basically questions that I've been asked a thousand times since, you know. Um, What's interesting about that is like, you think that that is so basic now, but I remember actually when I first met you, I asked you when I found out that you flipped RVs, I was like, oh, I want to like renovate the interior of my class C because it was all brown, you know, and I was like, I want it to Mm -hmm. be white. I've seen some of your pictures. And I asked you, how do you paint these cabinets? Because it's different than a house. It's mm-hmm. some of the wood is not real wood. It's laminate. Yep. How do you make the paint stick? There's an art to that, which you there is. mastered clearly. So the next one was a Montana, built that and sold it. And both the Denali and that first Montana had sold locally. And I, when people would come to look at them, I recognized that they were only interested in the interiors and not their structure. It's like the roof could have been rotted out. The tanks could have been cracked. The tires could be on their last leg. And the people didn't look at any of that. We're in a position to trick people because we could just go put paint on some moldy rig and sell it to them and they'd never know. So I said, we need to work with rigs that have good bones and that are built right. So who are the manufacturers that are doing it right? So I did a lot of research, everything led to Montana. And so I said, okay, 
we'll just make Montana our brand of choice. Fast forward, I had done a couple more Montanas. I didn't know this, but Montana found out about what we were doing. And so the Montana team and the Keystone team were watching us for several months. And I didn't know this. It was kind of like crazy to me that they even knew that I was alive, let alone want to work together. And so, yeah. so they were watching for several months. And so then I had posted on Instagram, like, hey, I'm going to this trade show. Love to meet up. Thinking other RVers, not thinking mm -hmm. Keystone. Well, the Montana team saw Instagram story that I had done and they messaged me and they were like, hey, um, I'm the product manager. I've been watching what you're doing love to talk to you and learn more. And I was like, Oh my God, what? Like the Montana team has been watching me and they want to talk and meet up like, no way, no way. And so mm -hmm. I was so nervous. So the trade show comes and I know I feel nervous for you right now. <laughs> yeah. And it's already happened. Okay. Oh yes. This was like two and a half years ago that this happened. And I was, Oh my gosh, it was I'm still kind of like tripping over my words thinking about it because I had no intention of catching Keystone's attention. Are you kidding me? And so anyways, meet up with the Montana team and the rest of the Keystone team at this trade show. And they were wonderful. Like I spent like an hour and a half with them just chit chatting. Like we walked through a Montana together and um, the product manager was like, what do you like? What do you not like? What would you do differently? And so I thought, you know, if nothing else, I've met the Montana team and that's pretty cool. They said, we would like to work with you. Um, but we need to go back to the office and kind of regroup. We'll be in touch. I'm like, okay. Like I'm not really expecting anything. And about a week later they reached out and they were like, we would like to fly you out to our factory, uh, to start the conversation of working together. I was like, Oh my God, what? <laughs> and so, um, and they, what were you thinking at the time? Like, what does that mean working? I don't know. You? I was like, I have no idea. So then they flew me out. They started the conversation. They were like, we would like to work with you, but a partnership like this has never happened in the industry before. There is no how-to book. So we have to make this up as we go. But what do you think if we start with pulling a brand new Montana off the line for you, giving it to you, giving you a budget and tell you to go build the craziest thing you can come up with? And I was like, done. We're in. That's we're in. Cool. I was like, I don't know any other details at this point. Like we're still at like high level stuff. And I basically committed like right there on the spot. They were willing to take the risk. We were willing to take the risk. They flew me out in April of 19. We packed up our shop and our RVs in August of 19 and drove out to Indiana. And uh, Keystone gave us a warehouse on their campus to build the concept RV. And so we were there as the the custom built shell rolled off the assembly line and literally like a half hour after it was done on the assembly line, it was in our hands and we were tearing it apart even further. Um, and then now wow. here it is, here's the, you know, the brainchild of, of the two of us, the concept RV. And it's absolutely beautiful. They gave you the RV, you, you build it out. Um, what was the reason, like, what are they going to do with this concept RV now? Like, what is this doing for Montana? You know, one thing that Keystone and Montana and all other RV manufacturers have to think about is what is mass appeal and what is going to appeal to as you know, as many people as possible. And so they don't really have the luxury or the manpower to be able to do really unique one-off interiors like this. And so it was kind of just a passion project for both of us and to kind of, um, have us open their eyes to something that could be unique and different. And, you know, if there's little pieces of this RV that they could, you know, take out and maybe that would spark, um, inspiration for them to do something different, you know, on the mass production line. Um, it was, it was kind of just a, a breath of fresh air, if you will. We debuted it in December of 19. Um, and then the plan was to be on display for all of 2020 and we all know what happened in 2020. So we got two solid months in of display. Basically we shut down for a year and a half. And so our, our first big display will be September of 2021. 
And I know you're at the Hershey RV show, which you'll be speaking at. Correct. Yeah. The Ultimate Montana will be on display and I will be speaking. One of the things that you talked about earlier was that there's not a lot of RV manufacturers out there that are doing things like what you have there, where it looks like this beautiful home or any of your other projects where you've flipped the RVs and renovated the inside of it. In the past, you've you've purchased the RVs yourself and renovated them, but are you still doing that? Or um, are people purchasing the RVs and saying, hey, Courtney, we would love for you to renovate it for us? Yeah, so where the business stands right now is um, up until now, the way it's been structured is we buy the RV, renovate it, and then sell them. We've got about 1,300 people on our waiting list to buy one of our RVs, which is nuts. Wow. You know, there's there's no way we can keep up with that. And so we're kind of transitioning into teaching people how they can do this. And so our next six months is really focused on building that infrastructure of education where we can just teach people how to do it. You know, one thing that we have focused on so greatly as the Flipping Nomad has been growing is making sure that structures are solid and that systems are solid and, you know, seals look good, roof looks good. People have really responded to that, um, which I'm glad because people are understanding that there's a lot more that goes into these RVs than just interior design. And you really need to have a solid structure. And so we are teaching the basics of, of structures too, just so people can have a really good baseline knowledge, even if they don't want to renovate and they just want to go look at a used RV or curious about their own. And so that is our uh, beginner's boot camp. Beginner's boot camp sets the stage and the groundwork for being able to renovate an RV, knowing that it has a good structure. So beginner's boot camp sets the groundwork for how to renovate your RV, which is the other course that we have built. So we walk you through everything you need to know from start to finish, like how to work through what you want to do to it, how to create your interior design, how to implement the design. Like we talked about the difference of real wood and fake wood and how to prep the surfaces and how the wall structures are like and how you prep those and the primer and paint and, and then everything else that goes along with it too, you know, like countertops and flooring and the pros and cons of planks versus sheet vinyl and how you trim it and how you rebuild a shower and make sure that it's road worthy. And how do you install real tile, you know, like you see here and make sure that it's right. road worthy and, and making sure that not only that it's road worthy, but that your RV can handle the weight, because even though we teach you how to build it road worthy, if it's going to be too much weight for your RV, you need to work with peel and stick. There's such a gamut of information that we pour into the students in the RV renovation course on top of the beginner's boot camp basic stuff. So do people have to take the beginner's boot camp first before they take the renovation course? We don't require it but we strongly suggest it. Which makes sense because the first one is about making sure that the bones and everything are mm -hmm. good. And, and then the second one is getting to the fun part of the renovation. Exactly. Right. exactly. <laughs> because you, you don't want to be polishing a turd, right? Like if the seals on your RV <laughs> are wide open, like you need to go reseal it before you jump into the fun interior design stuff. And you made some good points there because I was thinking about that earlier. You know, when I see your your RV, I'm like, there's a lot of stuff in there <laughs> that looks like it could be, I mean, it's, it's very well made. It's nicely done, but it can get heavy, it can. right? If you use too many, you, like you have to really pick the types of products and materials and stuff that you're going to use in it. And I'm glad that your, your course actually teaches that. So the course is open now. It is. Yes, it's open. And it has been something that we've been working on for about a year and a half, honestly, you know, just figuring out first and foremost, like, how are we going to break this information down? How are we going to deliver it? Make sure that we can create a one size fits all platform when people are doing custom things to their RVs, which is, you know, no one, two students are alike. It's been a labor of love, but it's out now it's released. It's like, you know, kind of feels like the birth of a child almost, you know, we've been working on it so hard and it's finally out to the masses now. Well, and I love that you've taken something that's super passionate for you and, and that other people are passionate about, but maybe they don't feel like they have the skills to do it. Mm -hmm. And so you being able to kind of scale your business a little bit, right. By creating this course and um, empowering other people to do it is 
is really a beautiful thing. So just my background a little bit, I don't even know if you know, but I've been in real estate my whole life. Mm -hmm. My dad was a home builder. So I've been around all of that stuff. But thinking about renovating like my van or a trailer or RV, it freaks me out because I'm like, I don't know what's behind those walls or, or, you know, like you said, painting these particular things or the weight. So I'm excited for you. It's amazing. Yeah. Course. Thank you. So. Yeah. And I mean, what you just outlined is like a textbook example of why mm -hmm. we put that out there. And, you know, thinking back to six years ago when I renovated my first RV, like, I had to build up a lot of courage and I would have killed for a course like this, you know, Absolutely. just somebody that has been there and done that and, you know, knows the structures and, and the materials. And, and the cool thing about what we do too, is my mom's actually a partner in the business and her and I are both full timers. And so we experiment on our own personal RVs first and watch how the construction technique holds up. We're teaching from a point of experience. So we show you how to do it, but then we also explain why we do it that way. So guys, if you're interested in taking Courtney's renovation course, make sure you click the link below. We'll provide all the information where you can go and take a look at it and get started. Uh, Courtney, I can tell you just from being around her, knowing her through the escapers group and seeing her work, you're going to absolutely love it. She's an amazing teacher and I'm just excited. Oh, so. thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really fun to finally have it out there. With the current RV that you have, uh, a lot of people might look at that and go, it's really, really big. I know you boondock a lot. You don't really stay in campgrounds very much. Have you found it to be difficult? Because how long is it? It's 40 feet with five slides. Holy cow. Yeah, it's huge. It's a monster. So, <laughs> you can go boondocking with it? You feel comfortable with it? Yeah, I boondock quite a bit with it. Um, and it's fully um, upfitted with, uh, you know, solar and inverters and batteries. And um, it's more than capable for being off the grid. It comes with its pros and cons, right? Like it's 40 feet long. It's got five slides. It's a party mobile. And we've had like easily probably 25 people in here before, you know, it's got a built-in, uh, you know, margarita machine and kegerator and this outdoor stereo. And so it's, it's good in that sense where you can host all sorts of people, but if you're wanting to get like super off the grid and down some like sketchy dirt road, you know, like this is probably not the RV not for you. Uh, you need something a little bit smaller. So, but you know, if, if you go smaller, then you can't, entertain as much and you don't have as many cool things built into it. So as people are shopping for their RV, that's kind of one thing that they have to define is how are they going to use the RV? Are they going to boot dock? Are they going to be more like a plug princess being at our RV parks? And do they what need you a, a plug princess? A plug princess. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of that before. What advice would you give anybody who's looking for that perfect RV? The advice that I would give to somebody looking for a perfect RV would probably be to realize that your first RV is rarely your forever RV because you are going to be thinking that you want certain features that aren't as important to you as others might be once you get into it. And then there's going to be things that you learn along the way that you wish you had. Um, I think size is a really big one too. You know, Amber, you're in like a tiny little, what, like 15 foot van. Yeah. 20 20 foot 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 foot. Foot. yeah. <laughs> like, four feet. Oh my God. 15 foot. <laughs> Tiny little thing. I mean, like, you know, you're I feel like that would be one of those little clown cars or something. Yeah, a teeny <laughs> tiny little thing. And I've been a 40 foot monster. People think that they need this amount of space or flip flop, you know, they want something super teeny tiny and they end up getting irritated with it no matter what it is. And so I don't think you can really dial in the exact type of RV that you want until you're in it. And so give yourself a little bit of grace to screw up on the first one, basically. At least get into something and start learning the road. Ropes, and then on your second or third one, you can get a little bit more dialed in on exactly what you want. What is, I mean, this might be actually hard for you to, to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Okay. Um, what do you think the average cost is to renovate? I mean, I know it really depends on finishes and things like that, but is there like an, a budget that you typically have in mind? Yeah. So it's putting a budget on 
the cost of renovating is tricky, you know, because it's like putting the budget on renovating a house. It could be the whole gamut of things. Uh, my very first renovation, the hard cost was about $3,000 and I would call it like a partial renovation. A rig that we finished earlier this year, the hard cost on it, I think it was like sixteen. dollars thousand dollars. Those are like two extreme ends of the spectrum. It really depends on the size of the RV and then what the client wants to put in it. If somebody, but that's the like- reason why I'm asking, by the way, so I can clarify that is, you know, people who are watching, I want them to understand that, you know, if they want to take your course and they want to buy a, a, a trailer or whatever they're purchasing to renovate, what kind of costs can they potentially expect? And is that something that you actually talk about in your course? We do talk about um, like the hard cost of what we have installed in the RV that we taught with. If somebody is on a tight budget and doesn't want to spend eight to $10,000 just on materials, they can basically set their budget and then work backwards from there. The important things that they really want to do in their RV and then um, kind of work backwards, like I said, from there. All right. So my last question for you, Courtney, is what's next for you? You've got, (laughs) I know we're just like doing everything, girl. (laughs) Yeah. We have, like I said, we've got a lot of irons in the fire, which is um, a very good place to be. Uh, We're kind of getting back up on the horse, I guess, like pre pandemic stuff. So we're taking the ultimate Montana out again, finally on display um, with its GMC tow vehicle, continuing to build courses for all things RVing um, as we see needs for them and continuing to build incredible renovations and uh, just keep making magic, basically. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of yours and what you're doing. And your story has always resonated with me. And I'm so happy you're able to come on here. And finally, I can interview you and share your story with everyone because I talk about you all the time. (laughs) It's ridiculous. I'm so so glad we were finally able to connect like this. Like, I know, I know. Finally on social media, we've done so much personal stuff together. I mean, I think you're a true inspiration, Courtney, and what you've done. And I love that you're empowering other people and displaying what people can do. Uh, Because I think that the important thing like that, that I love to teach is that this lifestyle to me is all about freedom. And I think if people can get that type of rig that they want, and maybe it's, you know, um, a used one and they want to renovate it and make it their own as a, a beautiful home that they can travel around with and experience the freedom of this lifestyle as a nomad. Yeah. And also even how I got started into the lifestyle of just being stationary and just doing normal traditional life a little bit differently and living tiny and minimally and helping out your finances and kind of your mental state too, where you just start purging yourself of everything. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because I I don't always talk about that, but you can, I have a couple of students in my course that have said like, can I just you know, I have a job in the city. Can I just live in the city with my RV and not move around? Of course you can doing exactly what what you did before. So I'm glad you mentioned that. So Courtney, where can everybody find you? Uh, We are mostly on Instagram at the flipping nomad. Uh, We do have a Facebook page. We don't really do anything with it. Uh, And we are like kind of on YouTube. We have uh, like one video out, I think. Amber, I, I, I need you to help me with, with YouTube. I need to trans, I need to transition onto YouTube, but uh, it's mostly Instagram and our website, uh, the nomad.com. And guys, I'm going to put a link down below to her social media and also her renovation course. So go check that out. Thank you so much, Courtney. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Amber. 